Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, The Next Five Years in SEO and PPC with Spotler and Iconic Digital. Thank you for joining. Um, I hope you can all see us and see our screen and hear us and everything. Uh, my name is Jess. I am the marketing manager here for Spotler UK, and I'm joined today by the award-winning marketing agency, Iconic Digital, and their chief executive, Steve Palethorpe. Spotler and Iconic have been working together for a number of years now to bring our clients success to their marketing. I will let Steve introduce himself once I've handed over. Just a few points on housekeeping. Uh, we'll aim to keep the session to 45 minutes long and we'll leave time at the end for a live Q&A. So any questions you've got throughout the session, please pop them in the question box on GoToWebinar and we'll make time for them at the end. You will receive an email later with a recording of the webinar and a copy of the slides so you can watch back on demand later on. Just a quick overview of Spotler, who we are and what we do before we begin. For those of you who don't know, uh, we are an all singing, all dancing marketing automation platform. Um, we offer a number of different solutions to our clients to help them take their marketing to the next level. We're part of a larger group of brands and we work with a number of different clients across Europe. What that means is that we can offer a, a collaboration of products from our platform to suit our clients' needs. So we're able to work with an array of different businesses from B2B, B2C, e-commerce, retailing, etc. Some of those solutions include WhatsApp for Business, website personalization and identification, so tracking the leads on your website, live chat, transactional email, cart abandonment. Most recently, we've just bought on a CRM platform, which is very exciting, cherry on the top for us. So I'm now gonna hand over to Steve, who is going to talk about all things SEO and PPC, what's coming up in the next five years, which is very exciting, very hot topic for marketers, I think, um, particularly as if you're not specialists in it, it's always a bit of a gray area. So it's great to have the um, experts themselves. So handing over to Steve now, don't forget to pop your questions in the chat box for the live Q&A at the end. Well, thank you so much and good morning and welcome to the session today. It is a huge privilege for me to be with you and to uh, come to you today with some hot off the press news and uh, insights and hints and tips in regards to the future for where search engine optimization and paid advertising is going across over the next five years. And of course, as partners of Spotler, we're here to help you. And so at the back of this call, I know you'll be getting the deck for you to delve into that and feel free to share it around with your friends as well. Any of your colleagues that want to know more information about AI and how this whole revolution is now fueling the technology revolution that we're living in with artificial intelligence and machine learning and how that's affecting Google and the way in which marketers can use these uh, these elements to grow your own businesses. So uh, a quick introduction. I, I've been in the world of search engine optimization for almost 20 years now. And for the last 11 years, I've been leading Iconic Digital as the founder and chief executive. And my aim today is to resource you with the tools to grow your business to the next level. We're gonna give you some super actionable insights today, guys, not just future thinking, although there's gonna be lots of that. I want to really give you some actionable tools that will affect your website's optimization right now. And so off the back of this, if you've got those questions, make sure they're in the chat. We'll of course be able to help you. We're delighted with the, um, the way that the business has evolved. We're a team of 26 SEO professionals now, um, award-winning agency this year, recognizing the CV Stevie's and also SEO Agency of the Year and recommended on RA as well. So really here to help you grow and uh, details for me are on the screen. If you've got any questions or you want to follow up at the end of the session, I'd be more than happy to have a chat with any of you um, just by way of our partnership with you and with Spotner. So let's get right into it then. Let's watch this video. Like, 
You got this. Let's go. Is a hot dog a sandwich? And the answer is... Yes. No. Yes. No. <laughs> Well, there you have it. Uh, yes, 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 of course. Is, is a hot dog a sandwich or whatever? Who knows? But uh, you get the idea. We are living in a decade of one of the biggest shifts in technology. And of course, it's all about artificial intelligence, how artificial intelligence is now linked in and connected with the power of Google. And we've got this race going on between the metaverse on one level, chat GBT and the open AI at another level, and of course Google, and how traditional search behavior with individuals like us that are searching every day to find information, how our own interaction with search engines and with chat is now changing and transforming. So we're gonna look at all of this together today. So here's our session overview. Firstly, we're gonna look at AI-driven content and how we can optimize that. I'm going to answer the big question, which I know most of you marketers in the room will be asking, which is, can I use ChatGBT to generate my blog content? Because if you can, then it's going to save you heaps of time. But if you understand the detail behind AI and how Google is preferring different styles of content, then we're going to get some insights here today that are really going to ensure that your content still ranks. We're then going to look at the personalized search experience. So this is all to do with how Google understands your own behavior based on the data that it's getting from you and then how it serves information to you based on your preferences. So we'll look at that. We're going to look at SERP dominance, so the rich and interactive features that appear. So these are the new SERP features that no longer are we optimizing just for the 10 spots that appear on page one of Google, but we're now optimizing for all of the rich interactive features that are coming on board. And over the next two years, we're going to see stacks and stacks of new interactive SERP features being shown. So it's really important that as marketers, as webmasters, we understand how to code our website to make sure that those elements are appearing within Google search. Of course, we all know about EAT. So EAT is all to do with user experience, expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. So how do you go about getting those things? And what metrics is Google looking at in order to understand your EAT profile and your EAT score? And all of this links in with what we call domain authority. And domain authority is the thing that helps our site grow in the rankings. So we'll look at that as well. I'm also gonna to touch on Google's challenge from the metaverse, because this relates not only to paid advertising, but it also relates to how search is going on as well. And these days with the more um, common ways to search for things emerging, things like ChatGPT on your phone, people are not going to the Google app necessarily, but there's more competition within that search space than ever before. So we're gonna look at that together. We're also then gonna look at the search evolution with augmented reality. Augmented reality, if you've never come across this before, this is about how you as a human being live in this virtual world it could be through a persona, an avatar, it could, could be through gamification or any of these other elements, but augmented reality and how that works and how that may then position interactions within the metaverse or the virtual world in the future, one of the biggest areas that big businesses are investing in at the moment is having brand positioning and brand presence within a virtual world. So we need to understand that as marketers if we're then gonna to look to the future to position ourselves in search. 
Okay, we're also going to look at voice search. Now, voice search being one of the main ways these days, over 76% of people searching using voice. So we're going to look at natural language processing and what we call question-based search. And I'm also touching on video content as a search essential. In other words, these days, we can't just rely on text on a page. We can't just rely on embedding a video or even using things like um, Vimeo or other providers to actually get video content on our site, we've got to actually go video first. So a bit like a few years ago when we were looking at mobile first, we're now looking at mobile first and video first as a search essential. We're also then going to touch on paid advertising and AI and paid advertising, specifically around dynamic ad creation and what that's going to do in the future. Because the power of the open AI, so things like ChatGBT and other um, open AI products, now gives us the ability to create dynamic ads on the fly. And that's going to revolutionize how we do paid advertising, particularly when it comes to display programmatic advertising as well. So we're also going to look at predictive analysis for user intent, we'll get into that in a bit more. And I'm going to look at domain authority and how to get search dominance. So if you're looking at positioning yourself above the competition, you need an SEO strategy that works. And I'm going to give you some of the things with link building and tools that are needed to ultimately get your site performing and outperforming the competitors, making sure that you appear in those all important new SERP features as well. So you ready to get into it? Give us a thumbs Thumbs up in the uh, in the comments if you can hear us and see us. Let's go with the next five years in SEO and PPC. Here we go. Right, let's watch this quick video, and this is about Google's 25th birthday and a bit of history of how you can cut a pineapple. We were on our honeymoon, and we were in Mexico, so we went to one of those open markets to get fruit, whatever we needed, and we got a pineapple. We got back, and he was like, "Okay, how do I cut this?" What do you mean, how do you cut this? You cut it. I didn't know how to cut a pineapple. I got on Google and I typed in how to cut a pineapple. And the first page that was on the list was how to cut a pineapple.com. And it was quite an experience, but I did get cut the pineapple and it was pretty good because we've never had fresh pineapple. I really like Google search because it usually finds exactly what I'm looking for. How do you cut a pineapple? Here's a video I found. Here's the right way to cut a pineapple. Wow, wow, wow. So the 25th year birthday just gone with Google. And of course, what does the future look like? Well, we know what the future, well, we know what the past was. And of course, it was all based on keyword search. And most of you, if you are above the age of around about 40, you will remember putting a specific key phrase into Google search and then getting results. A bit like the how do I cut a pineapple video you've just seen. But what does the future look like? Well, when we combine artificial intelligence, machine learning and big data into the picture, we have a huge host of different media outlets, media resources that are available to us that will answer the question of how you can cut a pineapple. So we now are looking at an immersive search experience that combines video, combines rich snippets, combines maps and different platforms so that we can then get the answer to our question. So the way in which we search, the way in which we ask Google things, it's all changing. And so Google is evolving at a rapid pace. Now, 96% of web users still begin their purchasing journey with a Google search. Now, we foresee that this stat is going to change because there are now new entrants into the search market. Of course, people do use Bing, and Bing is still the preferred choice if you are using the Xbox, for example, on your game station, and it will prefer uh, Microsoft Bing over any of the other search platforms. So do we think that Metaverse and, and Meta's search functionality is suddenly going to overtake Google? Probably not, but the entrance of OpenAI with ChatGBT and asking questions is going to grow. So the benefit that Google has at the moment is Google is providing instant, up-to-date, accurate results. ChatGBT, the OpenAI, is restricted at the moment to the date of last 
updates. But we are going to find with most of these AIs as they are generating and are upgraded that they're going to be constantly moving to a constant rollout. So 96% of web users currently begin their purchasing journey with a Google search. It will probably change to be 96% of web users begin their purchasing journey with a search. The platform, however, is up for grabs. So it is a new space. So what we're talking here is about AI and augmented reality transforming search behavior. Now, when it comes to Google, that exists across a myriad of different platforms. Of course, we've got Google Maps, we've got Google Mail, we've got various other cha channels that Google is using through Sheets and the workplace ecosystem, as well as their own dedicated AI barred solution now. So there's a lot of different platforms within the Google ecosystem, or should really call it the Alphabet ecosystem, that are actually there and available. And as we grow in this area, Google is linking all of these together, creating an immersive search experience that will exist across all of these different ecosystems. And this is really the power of how Google has positioned for the future. So unlike Meta, where Meta is currently only in one core area, which is the obviously the social presence, and there are different elements that are looking to move into, it is really having to work on the back foot against Google that already has established presence in these other different channels. Okay, so does Google understand what's on your website? Well, of course it does. And this is one of the most important questions is can I use ChatGPT to write content for my site? And the answer, friends, unfortunately, is no. And the reason for that is because Google understands which content on your website is content that is originated through AI and which content on the website is human and it's been written by an individual. It's very easy to spot AI content and these days you can actually run your content through an AI checker and that will give you the information as to whether this article is an AI piece or not. So should we be using ChatGPT or other styles of AI content creation tools on the internet? Well, of course we can, but we've got to make sure that we go in and edit that content so that it adds a human element to the content. And by doing so, human content is still being preferred over AI content and the accuracy and authority, remember our EAT um, factors there, the EAT factors are what gives content credibility. So we're gonna look at that together. So we're living in a decade of different devices, right? So we're talking about question-based search, and that's when people use their voice using Alexa, Siri, the Google Assistant, all manner of different search, um, voice search functions. And we're living in a decade where we've been used to our laptops, desktops, tablets, and smartphones. And of course, our smartphones are still one of the main ways in which we receive email, which we engage with searching. But that is all going to change because we're living in the day of the Internet of Things where everything around us is now a connected device. So even the fridge freezer that you go to to get your food out of will ultimately have a screen on the front tell you what's in it, let you browse the Internet from it. And of course, we know that in our homes, we're living in a connected house. And so these days you can have multiple connected devices. So with the Internet of Things, we're no longer talking about optimizing for uh, just appearing on a mobile or a tablet or desktop. And of course, we've looked, we've been through this, this iteration of website design where we've had to learn about scaling, how to make our website scale and, and, and transform itself to the device that we're presenting on. But now we've got a bigger question. What does our website look like on the coffee table that's interactive on front in front of me? So is it accessible on all of those devices? So the modern way websites are built, particularly with content management systems like WordPress, Drupal, Magento, some of the most popular ones, those websites have to scale and they have to grow in the, the ability to appear on multiple devices. So AI driven content is all about optimizing web results in the center of search. And so this is very, very different to how traditional search engines behaved. In other words, the, the old Google was preferring the top 10 ranking posts. And we knew, know that those top three search positions typically got the majority of search results. But now we're looking at how Google is using AI content to answer the questions that you're searching for. So this is all about what we call position zero and rich featured snippets, which many people these days are calling the SERP features. So to give you an idea, when you put something into Google, if a website has appropriate metadata on it, 
then there is now a new position zero space within search. So not the top three positions that are used for ads, not the 10 positions after that appear for organic search, but above those, the immediate answer to the question in position zero. So optimizing your site for position zero relies on question-based markup schema language to be actually embedded within your website. And if you haven't yet understood this and to taken time to make sure that your website has upgraded to include website markup language for schema mark markup language for SERP features, then your site will not appear in those slots. And the more authoritative your site is, the more it's going to rank in those areas. So we're looking at a future where SERP dominance with rich and interactive features is really going to grow. And this isn't just about position zero, by the way. Google is, over the next two years, going to be rolling out a huge number of different additional SERP features. So not only will there be questions, but they will be, and questions and answers, but there will be a whole range of different interactive content that you as a webmaster, as a marketer, can now access. So to get some more information about that, really suggest you jump onto the Google site, the Google AI site, which is called Google Bard. That will give you a lot of information about the future of AI being rolled out. And we're finding at the moment that Google is testing this in different regions, mainly in the States at the moment. Here in the UK, we're getting some of those coming through into .co.uk search. But the SERP features are one of the biggest ways that you will be able to drive traffic to your site in the coming years. So let's look at this. This is Google Bard. Gives you some information about where there is different stuff that is, is, is appearing in the rankings. So this is actually just presenting a right side column. So you can see there that you've got position zero. So this search was three tips for mindfulness. And actually, it's then giving you six tips for mindfulness right at the top in position zero. And that is from a website called Headspace, who had that markup language already there. And then in Google Bard, on the right-hand side bar, bar, it's presenting a whole load of additional stuff that's using ChatGBT and other open AI elements to combine information. So practical insights, here are three tips for mindfulness. Here are some additional information about mindfulness. So it's giving you far more information and letting you interact with the search engine. And one of the things that we're finding is if you look at the three icons to the right of the search bar, you can see the microphone for voice search, you can see the traditional magnifying glass for search, but you can also see the image extension there as well. And we're gonna see the introduction of a new icon appear in there, which will be like the uh, potions uh, logo or the potions icon that is an extension into Google Bard. That's coming very, very soon. It's already been trialed across the US. And this is going to enable you to do a deeper dive into search. And like in the video example we had earlier, you can put a very, very specific search question that will have the multiple parameters in it, in the same way that you would in ChatGBT. And that's going to yield and generate specific insights and results that are there for you. So what does this mean? Well, it means firstly that we're going to find a prioritization of position zero and page one results. So those results that appear at the bottom of page one with the increase of AI, the effectiveness of answering a user's question is going to grow in popularity and it's also going to grow in effectiveness. So what that means is that no longer will you probably scroll down, certainly not onto page two, but you will take your results from the top three and probably you're gonna take your results from position zero and where chat uh, GPT provides information through Google Bard as well. So really important to consider because if you are not ranking in those positions, then you're going to see a huge drop off in traffic coming to your site. And of course, we've already said Google can detect AI generated content. So how do we then go about using ChatGPT and other open AI solutions? Well, use it to come up with the subject lines, use it to do your research, use it to come up with the bullet points and be very specific in the prompts that you're using with ChatGPT to tell it about your organization. And rather than just saying generate the response and get it to write those, ask it if it's understood the prompt. Ask it whether it needs any further information about persona targeting, other things like that. If you include all of that information within your chat prompts, you're going to find that ChatGPT and other open AI tools will generate far more accurate information and content for you. And then once you've got those subject lines, then go away and write the content. Let me say to you again, AI generated content will not perform as well in search engines as, as content that has strong EAT parameters. Remember, that's experience, okay? So the user experience when someone comes onto your site, the expertise, 
So how expert is the content? the content on the site how authoritative and how trustworthy is that content so personalized search is going to be radically different one of Gartner's most recent studies into personalized search with AI has shown that Google is really trialing to try and make sure that is delivering specific results and this is largely through the use of a smartphone through the smartphone ecosystem so in other words when you're searching on your mobile Google's not going to give you the same results as it, as, as it would to me because it's tailoring my search experience based on what I look at, based on what I say, based on what interactions I have with other ads. So we're talking about a very, very big um, shift in the way that Google generates content. Now, I was uh, looking at this the other day and I came up with this quick video in my research, which I thought was pretty cool. And this is using the Google app interactive with maps and other channels as well so let's take a look at this the first thing i do is i open the google app but it gets even better google top use google maps to your full advantage this is a really great option and it's a game changer i don't know why it took me so long to figure this out but it has been such a time saver easy peasy work smarter not harder <laughs> So here we're talking about the whole idea of getting personalized content into the hands of the user. And of course, that's working now through the Google app, which combines map interactions and open AI content. So augmented reality all in one single place. And we're going to look at the map section in a little bit further when we start talking about Google My Business as well. So let's talk about EAT for a moment, because this is one of the key ranking factors for websites. So EAT, experience, expertise, authority and trustworthiness these four components now becoming more crucial than ever. So how do you go and get expertise? How do you get user experience to be a priority? Well, user experience is all, around, all about engagement. How tacky is the website? So we've always said that websites that have a low bounce rate typically have a greater search engine ranking performance. And then if you flip that the other way around, um, websites that have a high bounce rate will not appear in the search ranking. So one of the ways that we can really drive user experience forward is to get our website Site as tactile as possible. In other words, when someone arrives on our site, they will always take an actionable next step rather than jumping off the site. Now, there's simple things we can do to fix that, of course, telephone numbers that appear on the website. You've got a telephone number in the top right hand corner of your site. If you've got your social media icons on the top right hand corner of your website. Please move them out there because we don't want to be diverting people out of our page the moment they've come onto the site. You can remember things like the F principle, that's the eye tracking studies for where people look on a page. Positioning our content in the right places is so important. And of course, these days, we've already said it, video content is one of the most powerful things, making our website interactive with videos that autoplay. I'm not talking about adding audio, but showing movement and interaction on the pages makes the the web page more tactile, more sticky. So including those e parameters, we need to understand social media markers act as authority. So the higher our followership, the more interactive our followership is with our content. It's an authority tracker. So one of the metrics that Google uses for domain authority. If we're using uh, video, which we should be, of course, it needs to be video content that is placed and put into YouTube. So we're talking about the optimization of that video content, not just for our website, but for other video search engines like YouTube. And of course, there's many other search, um, or many other video hosting sites that are out there. But my counsel and advice to you would be that in the day of video where we're living in a video world of interactive search, you probably should be using YouTube and embedding that into your site. So the authority of linked websites that link to you is still one of the key ranking factors how Google determines whether your site has authority. So link building is not dead. It is still one of the most important components to ensure that you have got sustained domain authority. And if you're not doing link building, if it's not part of your strategy for SEO, and it's not part of what you're thinking about, then you've got to adjust your perspective. You have to be producing content that sits on other third party sites that has targeted relevant hyperlinks that come back to the pages on your site. If you don't have that, your site fundamentally is not gonna get found in search. So we also need to consider what Google calls its lighthouse metrics. These are our core usability metrics for things like page speed, things like uh, usability. So how does uh, the website behave? What are, are its 
basic trackers? Is it taking long to load? There's something called the largest contentful paint on the page. Sounds very complex, doesn't it? But all it means is, are the images loading at the right speed? If all of the images on a very, very long page take a huge amount of time to load, that's going to have a negative marker on your Lighthouse metrics. So working in ways that you can ensure that perhaps you're deploying a CDM, which is a content delivery network, on top of WordPress to ensure that you're serving the images and the, the information that's on your site in a way that makes it fast and responsive. The other thing, of course, is scalability. If you're serving a 4K image on your website, you know, it's going to take much longer than if that, that image was optimized to the appropriate resolution with 96 DPI, obviously, for the web. Now, bear in mind, if you're serving one image that then goes on your desktop, your tablet, your smartphone and the fridge freezer, then, of course, that image is going to be too big when it's on a mobile. So we're talking about image scalability so that the imagery on our site can flow with the site depending on what device it's seen on. So Lighthouse Metrics within Google, go and have a look at it. It's an important ranking factor to track. We've also got this other thing called YMYL. So YMYL stands for your money or your life. And this is all about search intent. In other words, Google is prioritizing sites that are either about your money or they're about things to do with your life. And of course, business is still part of your life. So it's one of the core metrics. So we've got to understand how to answer YMYL questions. And this is down to voice search. We'll get onto that in a moment. Next thing is all about link juice. And I've got my can of iron brew here. Makes you strong, of course. And this is a great way to think about a website because your website's like a container of link juice or domain authority. And domain authority is passed to us through other websites that link through to us. And if we haven't got that domain authority, as I've already said, you're not going to appear well online. And link juice is going to be an increasingly valid metric for SERP features. So if you've got domain authority, your SERP features, if you've got the correct markup language on your site, your site is going to be found in those additional SERP features at position zero. Okay, cool. So we've now got a lot of Google platform extensions that, that can be used to uh, refine results. Remember, we've talked about position zero a lot already, but these include things like text ads, knowledge panels, maps integ integration, obviously the Twitter X cards. Um, we've got other integrated elements with sports results, finance results, site links, all of those sorts of things. So these are all different components to consider adding that markup language to. And there's many different sites that will provide you with that markup language. So it's a bit of text that sits either side of that image or that question to tell Google that this is meta um, and metadata that could be used in position zero. All of that really, really important to include on your site. Let's take another look at a, another way in which Maps is now interacting through the Google search ecosystem. If you've ever lived in a city with underground transit, you know the problem I'm about to have. You come out of the subway station, look at your map tap, then end up completely walking in the wrong direction until the little blue dot finally catches up. The Google Maps team is working on a way to make that part of travel a lot easier, especially for pedestrians. It's working on a feature that can superimpose your navigation on top of a live view of the real world. Forget the map, you just see the street and there's a big bunch of arrows saying, go that way. Google lent us a phone with a new version of Maps on it so we could test out the feature. So let's go for a walk. Once you start navigating, if you hold your phone up or tap the right button, your phone will immediately open a camera and start scanning around. It's looking for familiar landmarks, signs, and more, just to see exactly where you are. Then it'll give you super specific instructions on where to go. But you're not really supposed to walk with it on all the time. Maps will even prompt you to put your phone down until you need it again, to save bandwidth and battery and probably your life. Just find your turn, put it down, and move on. So we know that this is quite a new feature, obviously, within the Maps ecosystem. But how does this interact when Google understands the images that we show it? So the more information and more data that is provided into Google, both of imagery, places, and information about businesses, the more Google is building up a virtual picture of the world and will then be able to assist us. And the same applies with the OpenAI. And one of the things that the challenge that we experience at the moment that Google is facing is from Meta. And of course, Meta currently stems across four ecosystems. We've got the two social channels, 
which of course is Facebook and Instagram. And we've got the two dark social channels of WhatsApp and Messenger. But we've got more extensions of those four primaries that are now coming through the metaverse. And the metaverse is now all about augmented reality. So there has been a flurry of activity to get businesses onto the metaverse. And as augmented reality, the visualization tools that are out there, as they change from what they are at the moment of these sort of weird virtual reality goggles, as they move into being more stylish, so perhaps even sunglasses or shades, you know, Ray-Bans, for example, this is one of the emerging trends that we're seeing where search can now interact with those elements. So Meta is presenting a huge challenge to Google. Do I think that Meta is going to overtake Google? No, absolutely not. I still know that Google, uh, people that are searching on Google show commercial intent and therefore users that go to social media are not. So when it comes to PPC, Meta ads have to be very disrupt disruptive and we use the methodology which we call stop the scroll. In other words, when someone goes onto Facebook or Instagram, they're looking for pictures of their friends and family. They're not looking for your business at that point. So your ad has to disrupt them right at the point. Now we can get a marginal saving on our cost per clicks, but ultimately we can still get conversions from Meta ads. However, users on Google are showing that commercial intent. So the future of where all of this is going, we're gonna see an emergence of different open AI tools where there are ads that are now shown next to answers to search questions. So bearing in mind, this is, could potentially be outside of Google's ecosystem. Right now in 2023, where we are today, we are principally talking about Google ads and meta ads. Being ads some of the time are beneficial, but the majority of web users are searching to, for people, uh, searching for businesses, searching for your products and services, and therefore using Google ads to get into the search network is still one of the most powerful ways. We still know that 96% of people don't click on the ads, they just jump down to the organic search results. And that's going to be more and more true as we int introduce position zero. So does that mean that we shouldn't advertise on Google? Well, of course we should, because it's free advertising until someone clicks on us. So having the brand visibility from a Google ad is still incredibly important. But these days we're gonna see a diminishing demand for ads in the style that we know them towards more dynamically generated ads that are highly targeted and specific to the user's persona. So let's look at the search evolution with AR. So not necessarily about wearing goggles and you know doing gamification or videos or that sort of stuff, but it could even be something like this. The next generation of Ray-Ban Meta smart glasses. These are the first smart glasses that are built in shipping with Meta AI in them. Starting in the US, you're gonna get this state-of-the-art AI that you can interact with hands-free wherever you go. We're gonna be issuing a free software update to the glasses that makes them multimodal. So the glasses are gonna be able to understand what you're looking at when you ask them questions. So if you wanna know what the building is that you're standing in front of, um, or if you want to translate a sign that's in front of you to know what it's saying, um, or if you need help fixing this sad, leaky faucet, um, you can basically just you know, talk to Meta AI and look at it and it'll walk you through it step by step how to do it. Um, we, we built in one more feature into these smart classes. You are going to be able to live stream to your friends and followers from your glasses. Everybody is ready to race and I am getting ready too. Let's go. Switching to glasses. Being able to share you know, what you're doing live with your friends and and followers while staying completely in the moment is the kind of thing that you can only do on, on smart glasses. So, all right, these Ray-Ban Meta smart glasses, we're launching them on October 17th, uh, starting at 2.99, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you all think of them. So there you go, October 19th coming up, you can buy your own Ray-Bans that you can then interact and have a search question with Meta rather than with Google via your Ray-Ban glasses. And this is quite a significant shift because this is now bringing augmented reality out of perhaps those sort of traditional visors that you would use on a game, but now bringing it into the real world where you can wear your shades and glasses day to day. And you can then ask Meta rather than Google all of the things that are on around you. So, hey Meta, um, what, what's the way to get to here? Or, hey Meta, um, 
I, I, what am I looking at right now? So these are quite powerful new features that are evolving, which could see a major shift in the search landscape. So how does ads work within that context? Well, when users are asking a question, we are generating an answer using the open AI or the meta AI or the chat GBT AI. So the answer to those questions is positioned without any adverts. So what we're going to see in the future is these different providers looking to see how they can add in new advertising parameters around the answers to questions. So we've already talked about position zero, of course, and interactive SERP features. We're going to see these continuing to dominate the space, particularly when it comes to Google. And voice search and natural language processing is really important. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me, have a quick... Uh, <clears throat> quick slug of the iron brew. Um, one of the things to consider when it comes to voice search is the questions that people are searching to find you. We know that language has changed. Before we used to put keywords into Google. Nowadays, we are putting questions. So your website has to answer the questions that people are searching for right now. And the process to do that is very straightforward. It's all about going onto Google, drawing that information out through the keyword planner using other tools that are in the market like SEMrush or Ahrefs or some of the other third party extension toolkits to get that information. Once we've built that keyword universe report, that keyword research database, we can then choose those questions and align the content on our site around those areas. So one of the key things to do is make sure you've included an FAQ page, but don't include the full answers to the FAQ within that page put links on there to individual FAQ articles that answer those questions and see those as a driver for traffic coming into your site, making sure that you've included the Google markup language so that Google knows you are answering a question that someone is searching for. Okay, so voice search and AI has shifted the way that we search online. 72% of searches are now being completed via a mobile device. And this is going to shift with the introduction of new ways to search. We're going to find voice search is going to grow in authority. This stat of 72% is what Gartner was predicting for 2023. The early results from where we are in now in October for September's results shows that actually we're about 74% of all searches being conducted by a mobile device. So it's actually slightly higher than was predicted. Okay, so how does AI work in a paid search environment? Well, one of the most important ways that we position in paid search is through extensions into the Google Display Network, but also through the ads of dynamic ad creation. Now, I've got a slide on here that's showing visuals, and of course, within the search ecosystem, it's text. However, on the display ecosystem, we're going to get different banner ads that are being served. So one of the ways that we're seeing developments within Google Ads is the introduction of dynamic ad creation, where Google will itself come up with recommendations for the extension of the ads based on the keywords that you target. So making sure that our ad copy appeals to the right audience and we we've put in the appropriate persona targeting there is absolutely pivotally important. We've already seen this over the last year as Google's AI features within paid search are now encouraging more and more searches or more and more results and ads to be served on different results. And you can extend your ads now through the open AI to ensure that you get ad placement on long tail keyword searches. And a long tail keyword search different to a short tail keyword search. Let me just run through that for you. Most people in my world, my ecosystem, would search for a phrase like digital marketing. And digital marketing has about 14,000 sessions every single month. However, I don't want my site to rank for that phrase because it could be students, it could be teachers, it could be business owners, a huge volume of different personas trying to search for that phrase. So we have to find the long tail extension of that primary key phrase. And the way we do that is to extend that keyword to something like digital marketing consultants in London, for example. So we've got a geographic component in there, and we know that that search only has around 100 searches a month. So even though it's a much lower volume, the likelihood or relevancy from transactional intent behind that search is about 95%. So in other words, when someone searches for that key phrase, they're more likely to take an actionable next step when it comes to your website. I did this for the Harley Street Ear, Nose and Throat Clinic. When they started out with us, they had zero key phrases that they were ranking for. Over the course of the last four years, we've been optimizing their site using a combination of these SEO strategies. They now rank for 35,000 page one keyword results. 
for ear, nose, throat, surgery related phrases. A huge volume of targeted long tail keyword extensions that generate that website over 120,000 sessions every single month. And that's how it works. If it can be done for one organization in the ENT world, just imagine what it could be done for your professional services business. So this is the power of using SEO and combining it with ads and other extensions to drive targeted relevant traffic. So of course, Google is wanting to give you a personalized search journey. And these days, if you are not like me, but if you're wearing an Apple watch, one of my colleagues seems to think that Google is taking data about your lifestyle from things like Apple watch and things like that to then know when you're stressed, to know when you're feeling unwell, to know when you're on a run or when you're going to the gym or know when you're sleeping so that it can then tailor search results in the future. Now that's not happening now, but this is the future of we believe where the whole metaverse is going and where the whole Google search experience is going to have interactive data that exists from devices that are held on our hands. There is even at the moment, this school of thought that someone will put a chip in your arm and that chip will then send data and control data and enable you to buy stuff. We've seen it rolled out even in Sweden as well. So this is stuff that's actually happening right now. So domain authority is still the main metric to gain SERP dominance. Domain authority primarily comes from link building and from other ways that we can generate new inbound hyperlinks to our site. So here's how to build that domain authority. First place, we need to complete some keyword research. So we're looking for the identi identifying the transactional key phrases that individuals are searching for. We're then going to optimize our website around those. So that's things like page titles, meta descriptions, the things that are shown in Google search. And then finally, the lighthouse elements of what our website has on it. So content, so we're talking about page speed, usability, bounce rate, all of that sort of information. Once we've done that, we need to start focusing on building quality backlinks from other websites. So what's a quality backlink? The quality backlink is a link that comes around content. So press releases, PDF submissions, directories that have high domain authority. These are quality sources which will drive links into your site. So we've got to choose those transactional keywords which will ultimately lead to more sales leads. And remember again, your website is answering the questions that people are searching for. So here's how it works. Does your content answer that prospect search query? Yes or no? Have that FAQ page on your site that drives increased traffic. And then once we've got those transactional searches, we're gonna find that we start to convert more prospects than just from informational search phrases. So our learning center or our blog, as I'm calling it now, I'm calling it a learning center these days rather than the blog, mainly because we're posting so much content on there. These days we are recommending that the average length of the blog has risen from 750 words to around 1500 words. And the frequency that you need to be posting has risen from once a week to three times a week if you want to get the visibility and exposure to your blog. Okay, so it's a lot more than it used to be. So Google is preferring sites with longer form content and those that have high authority in posting more regularly. Okay, so organic and paid search, right? Let's look at the difference very quickly. Bear in mind that 96% of users still prefer the organic search results. So we are gonna see a diminish, oh, excuse me, a diminishing number of people clicking on Google ads, but we're gonna see different styles of ads that are more tailored to the user than ever before. So Google search network, of course, is still the most popular ad tool, but remember we've got the display network, we've got shopping, we've still got remarketing. If you're not doing remarketing, it is free advertising, guys. When someone comes to your site, you cookie them, they leave without checking out or without taking a next step. And for the next 90 days, you're serving your ad, you're getting free brand awareness to them based on that. Oh, we don't know what's just happened there, but we've just done an update or something. Let me go back to the deck. There we are. Okay, so retargeted users are always 72% more likely to complete on an online purchase. Remember that and an optimized landing page for dynamic ads is likely to convert three to 13%. So if you're not getting a minimum of 3% conversion to your landing page, you know you've got to do something about that landing page. So think of the F principle, where you position content on the page, logo top left, call to action straight down, navigation along the top, no social icons, no telephone numbers, things that will detract and take you out the site we're removing those from being visible using video content. Okay, all of this sort of stuff is really, really good. 
Finally, Google My Business, making sure that our GMB profile is up to date, accurate, and that we're setting the reach of our ads and the reach of our organic visibility within GMB is still really, really essential and important. Make sure you're posting your blogs and your updates onto GMB because GMB still appears in position zero slots. So it's another benchmark for making sure that we've got content appearing in position zero. So finally, we're going to talk very quickly for the last three minutes about conversion rate optimization because your website has to become a lead generating funnel. And if you haven't got that funnel, then ultimately we're never going to convert that traffic into sales leads. And to be honest, if I look at some of our websites, they make my eyes bleed. Too much color, too much information in the wrong place. What do we do? Well, we follow the F. Yeah, capital F, if you're marketing to an Asian audience, of course, it's an inverted F, but follow that eye tracking study. It's still very relevant from 2023. Make sure that you use your colors. So your background color should be neutral. Primary color is your brand color. The secondary color, the call to action. Remember, blue hyperlinked underlined links still increase the click through rate by up to 28%. So if you want people to take a click to the next element, hyperlink it, make it web blue. OK, really, really important to do. So I finish with this. If you're a marketing strategist in the room, you need a strategy that's going to work. And digital marketing, we call it the seven steps marketing chassis. Ultimately, it's using SEO, paid ads across Google and Meta, classic social media amplification strategies, email and marketing automation with content marketing, digital PR, that sort of stuff to drive targeted relevant traffic through to your digital asset, your website. Your website's the place where the Google Tag Manager is. It's the place where Analytics 4.0 is. It's the place where your Spotler Leads is. So you're going to have your lead tracking software sitting there to convert all of these prospects. You've got your funnel. It's lead generating, and we are remarketing to that audience. So therefore, we know that we have a proven cost per acquisition. And that's what we're looking for today. So we are giving you our free copy of The Digital Revolution to thank you for coming on the webinar today. It's yours, it's free. We've got the seven steps marketing chassis. We've got two whole chapters in there about how to do SEO in the modern world that we're living in. We've got some practical how-to guides that are supporting the book. And there's free access to our community with loads of videos and our learning center that gives you behind the scenes insights directly with me to take your marketing efforts to the next level. And if you want that, we'll be sending you out an email with the information, just send us your details. Promise not to spam you if you're sending it to your home address. It's purely so you can get a copy of the book into your hands. Available on Amazon for $12.99, of course, as well. But as you come on the course today, the webinar that provided by Spotler, because of our partnership, we're able to give you a free copy of that as well. Also, on your screen right now, we are offering you a consultation for £2,500 of free marketing, courtesy of our friends over at Action Coach the coaching uh, uh, franchise in the UK, they are putting forward the money to enable you to get a free marketing audit. So yes, that means you pay nothing, but you get all the benefit of an hour with me with some post reports that follow up on all of those things. So we'll include an SEO report, we'll include the keyword analysis, we'll do the competitor research, we'll do all of this for you so that you can get the tools you need to ultimately scale your business. So scan the QR code or follow the link in the deck afterwards, register your details on there, and you'll get that follow up uh, with me to have that one hour session where we'll go through things. And then you also get the two and a half grand consultancy to use for all of those post reports. So it's a real win win. And thanks again to our friends at Action Coach for providing that for you today as well. So on that note, I'm going to open up for some questions. I think we're bang on time. Yeah, five, 10 minutes to go. Thank you for being with us. I hope you found this session informative. Hope you found it useful and it's been thought thought provoking for you. If you want to come on one of the future courses, we run loads of practical how-to courses, which are more workshop focused as well. So if you want to know how to write the content, or if you want to know how to do link building, or how to position yourself to, to appear highly in paid ads uh, through the search network, then come on one of these specific courses, and we'll delve into it in a little bit more detail. But I'm going to hand, up, hand back to the team at Spotler to take your questions, and I'll answer any of those over the next few minutes. Great. Thanks, Steve. We have had quite a few come in, so we'll try and work through them as quickly as possible because I'm just conscious of time. The first one, what are the top three thing, key things I need to know about SEO if my organization doesn't do it much at all? Okay, top three things. Keyword research, on-page optimization, 
And finally, link building. So keyword research is identifying the key phrases that people are searching to find you. Do that through SEMrush, through the Google Keyword Planner, through Ahrefs, all free of charge to go and get that information. You don't need the paid versions. Download those keywords and then write your content for them. And then go on Google Lighthouse, free to use in the Webmaster Tools area in the Search Console. That's free and it gives you access to know all of the things that you need to adjust on your website to optimize it for Google. And finally, start that process of link building. And I would aim for around 10 quality links to be produced every single month around those targeted key phrases if you've never done link building before. Bearing in mind, guys, don't go for the paid links. You don't want to be paying for links on different places. It's not sustainable, and those links only last for about three months. So you might get an initial surge, but it's no long tail sustainability from those links. It's automatically placing organic links in editorial sites. So things like my news desk, free PR wire, um, prhub.co.uk, um, releasewire.com. These are the type of places to go get those links from. Hopefully that helps answer your question. Brilliant, thank you. Do you have examples of AI checker tools to check content? Yeah, there are actually loads of great examples. And if you just do a Google search into check my content for AI, it will bring you up the top four or five that are available in the market. Some of them are free. I've personally found the paid ones to be slightly better. And it's a small monthly subscription, about five pounds a month. And that will give you access that it gives you a traffic light red, amber, green system, and it will give you a percentage score that if you're above a certain threshold, then that is a warning mark for AI. But if you're below that threshold, then that's considered to be a human generated piece of content. So if you're really struggling to write content, you're getting writer's block, then you could use something like ChatGPT, but then run it through one of those AI checking tools and then add your own content markers in there. And that way you can get it to the point where it's below the threshold to post on your site. Fab, thank you. How important is imagery on a website? So, for example, right. images of product. Yeah, great question. And the answer can only be found when you go into Google and you look for your competitors. So, do a keyword search on the on the product or the service area or the question based search term that you're looking at, and look at the top three results that Google is ranking. If Google is ranking um, uh, three websites, they will normally have, or it'll be ranking hundreds, but the top three ones that it's ranking, they will have commonality. First things, the meta title, so page title, the meta description, are they using similar words? When you then go onto those websites, they'll usually all have a video or they won't have any videos, or they'll all have a similar number of images. So take a look on those sites and look at the commonality to see which, which Google is preferring for a given search term. Let me give you an example. In the educational setting, imagery is used less, and therefore websites that rank on more technical educational search phrases typically have less images on the web page, whereas product searches or information about a service typically have five or six images. So you're looking based on the number of images that are on the sites that Google favors in its top tier positions. So go check it out, go find, have a look, look at the common fact ranking factors, look at the common features on those pages, and then replicate those into your landing page. You're not copying, you're curating. So you're taking those common factors, taking the number of images, putting them onto the site and watching the results as you then build links to that page. Brilliant, competitive research. Um, we've had a couple of questions asking how to get a copy of the book. So if you could just reiterate that and also how to get involved with the how to workshop sessions. Yeah, great. So I'll put this on the screen again for you today now. Oh, whoopsie daisy, sorry. Um, so you've got the ability to scan the QR code. That will give you two and a half grand of free consultancy free SEO and website audit, as well as the competitor analysis, 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 competitor analysis and a personalized strategy. So just scan the code. If you are on your phone right now and you can't scan your code, take a quick screenshot and then do it later. Or um, we will be sending out an email later with the link and we'll also be asking you to respond to that email with your address to get the free book. So you just send us your home address or your work address, whatever's easiest for you. As I say, the, the, the address is just purely for the basis of sending the book. You have our personal assurance, it's not gonna be used for anything else. So we will send you that book as our thank you, gift to you for coming on the webinar today. Um, and look out for that email, it'll be coming to you later today. That's great, thank you. 
going back to the Ray Bans, um, the yes. Meta glasses. Coming out twenty um, second of October, right? Right. So, could these be helpful with visual or hearing impairment? Oh yeah, I mean uh, for, for sure. Like they're, they're they're not just meant to be a style feature. They are practical glasses, right? So, um, particularly for disabled users or people who are not able to work with a, a desktop or a laptop or something like that, this is going to revolutionise the way that they interact with the world around them. So. This is emerging technology, right? This is hot off the press. That video actually was only launched a few days ago. It popped up in my feed. I thought I'm adding that in the deck because it's so relevant for us. You know, this is an emerging thing. So do I suspect that the use of the meta AI in video and in glasses is going to be the new trend for next year? Probably not. Is there going to be a big enough community that keep using meta glasses with Ray-Bans to make it, make it a sustainable business model for meta? Who knows? But for sure, right now, if you have a disability or if you're not able to use a desktop laptop or a smartphone and you want to have visual results in view that you can actually see when you're looking at stuff, I think it's going to be a great thing. I will certainly be getting a pair of glasses to try myself. <laughs> Excellent. Um, just a couple more. The first one, will link building be as valuable as it is now? That's a great question. And I think SEO professionals have been asking this question for the last five years. Lots of people who don't understand how to do link building have always said that SEO is dead and SEO with link building doesn't work anymore. And it's a load of rubbish. If you speak to any core competent SEO professionals, they're going to tell you that there has been a shift away from the traditional style of links. You know, in the days gone by, we used to create hundreds and hundreds of links all going to one page. We'd stuff keywords in on that page. We'd do all these sort of uh, things to try and deceive Google. And Google's obviously wise. It's going through an evolution all the time to become smarter and smarter in the way that it understands and interprets data. And because of that, we can't fool Google. We've got to be genuine in the way that we work. So building those eat authority trackers is significant. So how you get um, authority, how you get uh, trustworthiness, how you, how you are given all of those ranking factors comes from a myriad of different ways. Link building is one of those because the more quality links that are given to a landing page, it communicates that that website has a high level of domain authority, link juice, right, that tops you up. So link building isn't going anywhere, but the style and the shape and the parameters around those links, combining that with additional other ranking factors, things like social media tracking, things like the number of followers that are sharing our content, things like the number of views and impressions for our videos in YouTube, all of these additional elements are going to become more important in the future. So link building 100% is not going anywhere for 23, 24. The style and the quality of those links needs to be improving and getting rid of any links that are toxic in intent or toxic in nature. And you can find all of that information out by just doing a quick link toxicity check, either in Google Lighthouse or in SEMrush. Great way to have a look and see the quality of your links and the location of where those links are. One final example, so I was working with a customer just yesterday and one of the customers came to me because they were ha having an issue with ranking performance and that website, they were targeting for the UK, but 83% of their links were coming from websites hosted in the US. So very simply, those websites were valid sites, but because they weren't hosted in the territory they were targeting, we flipped those sites off, we shifted those links onto UK focused sites, and by doing that, within a couple of days, we've seen already there being an uplift in the amount of authority that's been passed to that site from those UK links. So we've had another customer where this has also had a massive effect over the last couple of months by reprioritizing links that are in other territories to focus around the territory that, that they were targeting specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think this is the last one. Does Google markup language need new dev support to implement? That's a great question. And the likelihood is, it, the only way I can answer that question is depending on web platform you're using. So using the most common ones. We're, we're big advocates for WordPress at the moment, for Drupal as well. So if you're using an open source content management system, open source just means that the community out there are developing modules, add-ons, and having input into the future evolution of that 
content management system. If you're using an open source CMS, the likelihood is that markup language will automatically be included. It's not off the shelf at the moment, so you will need your developer to be involved in that process. It is a technical update, but if you make sure that you are deploying it right now, you are going to be winning and getting more traffic from position zero. So is it a must have? In my view, absolutely. Brilliant. That's all the questions. So thanks Brilliant. so much, Steve. Really, really great webinar. Hope everybody enjoyed it. Thanks everybody for joining. And as we said, we'll send out a recording and the slides hopefully this afternoon will hit your inbox. Thank you ever so much. It's been a privilege to be with you. Thanks again for coming on. And if you've got any questions, be sure to follow up with us. All the details will be in your email later this afternoon. Back over to you guys. Just as a thank you for joining our webinar, we at Spotler are offering a 14 day free trial of our website visitor identification platform, which is Spotler Leads, which Steve touched on briefly in his presentation. So identifying, tracking and nurturing the leads on your website, scoring them so you can identify who's hot, who's ready to buy and automatically nurturing them to become ready to buy. So if you're interested in our 14 day free trial, please also get in touch and we'll set that up for you. It's just a code that you pop on your website, very similar to Google Analytics. Thanks again, guys. Have a great rest of the day.